Hi everyone, welcome to Smart Training 365. I'm Mo Larby and I'm with my associate, Doug Brignoli. Doug, how you doing? Hey Mo, how are you? And how's everybody out there doing? Very good, excellent. So for those who uh, joined us for the first time today, what we do here is we talk about resistance exercise. We evaluate the exercises recommended by fitness influencers online or in magazines. And uh, you will really benefit from this because you will know which exercises you should use in the gym. So you avoid injury risk, wasted time and effort and get maximum results. So we highly recommend that you subscribe to the channel. So in today's video, we're going to talk about triceps exercises. How many of you looked for triceps exercises online? There are thousands of recommendations and each person is trying to add a little tweak to the exercise. So today we have biomechanics expert, Doug Brignoli to help us evaluate these exercises. But before we start doing that, I want to ask you, Doug, a question about that we talked about before, which is full range of motion versus partial rate of motion, range of motion. Why is that important for muscle growth? Well, um, first of all, let me just give a caveat here, and that is that when we talk about other people's recommendations, we're not trying to make anyone look bad. We, we know that it's not enough to say, here's the best exercise for the bicep right? Because you're going to ask, what about this one? Well, what about this one? What about this one? So here we explain why those other ones that are being recommended aren't as good as something else. Okay. So it's not that we're not trying to be the bad guy here, but we're trying to be the consumer advocate. We're trying to be the one to inform you as to how you know what's good and what's not good and why. So the issue of range of motion um, is basically very simple. They've done a lot of studies that have shown time and time again that full range of motion is far more productive, both from the standpoint of muscle growth and also from the standpoint of increasing that muscle strength through its entire range of motion, right? So if you do a partial range of motion, then you're working that part of the range of motion in terms of strength and that part might get strong, overall the muscle will grow less. Now they, the studies they've done have shown that you can actually use less weight with full range of motion and get more muscle growth than you can with more weight and less range of motion, right? So the problem is that a lot of people think that the heavier weight they use, the better. And they don't realize, maybe because they choose to not realize that the range of motion is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So pretty soon you're just doing this little itty bitty motion like this, but you're using a lot of weight. And so you think you're doing the right thing when in fact, full range of motion with less weight would be far more productive. And sometimes the exercise doesn't allow full range of motion. Well, in some cases, um, using full range of motion has some risk, right? So either it depends on whether or not there's a load, a lot of load at the beginning or at the end of the range of motion and which muscle we're talking about. But generally speaking, the first 10% and the last 10% can sort of be left out. The middle 80%, which is a lot of range of motion, by the way, 80 range of motion should be done with most, if not all of the exercises. And if you're not doing it, then you have to ask yourself, why am I doing it? Because I'm trying to favor using a heavy weight. Am I doing it because that this particular exercise maybe, you know, is like, for example, if you bottom out on a preacher curl, you know, you know, instinctively that you shouldn't do that. Right. There's a huge amount of bicep tendon risk on a preacher curl. If you bottom out with a, even, well, even with a moderately heavy weight. So, right. When we say full range of motion, we mean full-ish, 80%-ish range of motion. Okay. All right. Let's uh, look at the first exercise. First exercise, I'm going to be doing a close grip bench press. A closer grip than the regular grip. The biggest issue when people do close grip is that they go too close, which is not good on your wrist and on the top of the bottom of the movement. This is a horrible position for your wrist to be in. Instead, you want them in a strong position, which is going to be just inside your shoulder width level, lifting the bar up, then lower the bar toward the bottom of the chest, which is more than you would on a regular bench press. The regular bench press would be somewhere in the middle of the chest, keep those elbows tucked throughout the entire movement, really focusing on pushing with your triceps. All right. 
Okay. Well, to understand this exercise and whether or not it's good or bad, we have to explain uh, one of the 15 premises, one of the 15 biomechanical factors that are involved in determining how good an exercise is. And that is an active lever versus a passive lever. So imagine a lever, let's say a pendulum, right? When the pendulum is hanging straight down and it's vertical, it is parallel with gravity. It is a passive lever. If that was your forearm in a standing dumbbell curl hanging from your elbow, your bicep would not be loaded at all because that forearm is in the vertical position. An active lever, a fully active lever is one that's horizontal if we're using free weight, horizontal because that's the position where that limb is perpendicular to gravity, right? So imagine that you're doing a, a, a supine dumbbell skull crusher, right? When your arms are straight up and your forearms are parallel with gravity, vertical, there's no load on your triceps at all. As you bend your elbows, the percentage of load on the tricep increases and it reaches maximum when it gets horizontal. It reaches maximum when it's perpendicular to gravity. That's a fully active lever, okay? So when you're looking at an exercise like the close grip bench press, you have to ask yourself the simple question, is the forearm more horizontal or is it more vertical? Is the upper arm more horizontal or more vertical? Whichever muscle is operating the horizontal uh, lever is going to be the more loaded muscle. Whichever muscle is operating the more vertical lever is going to be the less, right? So when, when Mo was doing that, what you'll notice is that there's something that that person who, was, who Mo was quoting um, didn't actually say, but was hoping that you would do accidentally. And that is that when you do the close grip bench press, that you allow the hands to come inward a little bit from the elbow. Mo was doing it in a way where the, the, the forearm was perfectly vertical, which means it was no tricep involvement, none. Now, if he would have bent his elbows a little more, he would have gotten a small percentage of load, but nowhere near as much load as you would get on a skull crusher when the forearm gets horizontal, right? So here's the thing. And it's, this is very important. We're talking about percentages here. We're not talking about a different movement. The elbow is still straightening just the same. The tricep is extending just the same. The difference is the percentage of load of what you're using, of what you're lifting, and how much of that falls onto your triceps. So if you were to do a close grip bench press with what might be considered the most tricep-friendly, uh, tricep-centric load, the most you'd be able to get is an angle that's about maybe 10 degrees, right? So you're only getting about 10% of the amount of weight that you're pushing. And the front deltoid is doing most because the, the upper arm lever is the one limb is the one that's getting the most load to its muscle. So this is, this is a, a silly way of making you believe that the amount of weight you're lifting is directly related to the amount of tricep load you're getting. It's completely unrelated. It's all about physics. You're, you're better off doing 20 pounds in each hand skull crushers than you are doing 150 or 200 pounds on a close grip bench press. Let's say if my elbows were slightly in and the, the triceps are involved, how good will it be? Well, again, we're talking about percentage. You, you increase the percentage of load to the tricep, but, but there's no way as long as that upper arm bone is lowering as long as you're letting that upper arm bone get horizontal because you notice when you do this the upper arm bone stays vertical right it doesn't come down as soon as that upper arm bone comes down it limits your ability to angle your forearm enough to make it a high percentage load exercise to the triceps even okay. in the best case scenario the most you'd be able to get is maybe 18 to 20 percent of the load on your triceps you're better off getting a hundred percent of the load with a skull crusher. Okay, so just to, to make sure that we cover the, all the possibility, let's say if I did it like this, will well, that be more? Again, that's more, that's more percentage. Okay. That's more percentage, but, but why, why do that? In other words, why use an exercise? Let's just say that you do it in a way that gives you 50% or 60% right? And you're letting that upper arm bone go up and down, which means you're activating the front deltoid. Why? Why? 
look, if, why pay more for a piece of property than you need to, right? What you want to do is get the, 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 the most bang for the least bucks, right? You want the least investment of energy and the most reward. And the way to do that is to keep the upper arm bone relatively vertical, relatively in the neutral position and cause primarily, if not exclusively, that forearm to get horizontal. Okay. All right. Let's move on to exercise number two. The second exercise is the easy bar skull crusher. I like doing these on an inclined bench. It just helps me feel it better in my triceps. But one thing that is a little different with my form than I think most people's form is most people start with their arm vertical on the neutral position. My issue with starting that way is that at the top, I'm no longer putting tension on my triceps. I'm pretty much just resting because my arm is straight up and down versus starting back here. Now my triceps is already being engaged. I can lower the bar. I can keep my elbow in the same spot and I can feel the stretch of my triceps pressing the weight out, squeezing the triceps, and maintaining the pressure. Okay, well, the first thing I have to say there is that it is a mistake to call that a skull crusher. And the reason it's a mistake to call that a skull crusher is because the bar comes nowhere near the skull. <laughs> you are not approaching the skull. A skull crusher means you're bringing the bar to your forehead. What he's doing there is, I'll, I'll modify it, he's doing an overhead tricep extension right? Because his arms are up over his head. He's doing an overhead tricep extension with a resistance curve that he thinks is better than the standard resistance curve, but it's actually less good than this. And the reason for that is this, if you were to play back that video, and I'm not asking you to do that right now, okay. Mo, um, if you were to play back that video, you would notice that the starting position of the forearm is almost vertical. Now, that is that way by default. In other words, what this person is trying to do is he's trying to get the forearm to be more horizontal than it would be on a flat bench skull crusher when the upper arm is vertical. In other words, he's trying to add load, add resistance to the end of the range of motion. All right. Well, he probably doesn't understand the physics of that, but he understands that it loads the end of the range of motion more than a standard skull crusher. The part he doesn't understand apparently is that muscles all have a strength curve. And the strength curve is that they're always stronger in the early part of the range of motion and weaker in the end of the range of motion. So it makes more sense to use an exercise that loads the early part when that tricep is stronger and lessen the load when the tricep is weaker in the contracted position. So um, it is true that uh, having a little bit of resistance at the end of the range of motion is better than no resistance at the end of the range of motion, but you could easily do that on a flat bench. All you have to do is just tip your, your upper arms back a tiny bit, right? And now you get kind of the best of both worlds. You get more at the beginning and you get less at the end than you would if it was straight up and down, yes, but you get, you don't want to end up with too much resistance at the end of the range of motion. And that's what would happen on that one. That's, by the way, what's wrong with a tricep kickback. Same thing. You've got too much resistance at the end of the range of motion and not enough when the muscle most needs it in the early part of the range of motion. What's also important to note there is that there's no reason why you need to put your arms overhead to work your triceps. That position, I'm sure all of you would agree, is less comfortable on your shoulder joint than would be either a, a standard flat bench skull crusher or even a tricep pushdown, right? In fact, the best place for your upper arm to be when you're doing any kind of tricep extension is closer to the side of your body, not over your head. Now, some people will argue that if you put your arms overhead, you work the long head of the tricep more. Yeah. And the reason why they say that is because the long head of the tricep is the only part of the tricep. There's three parts. The only part that crosses the shoulder joint and ties into the scapula. And so when you put your arms overhead, you get more tricep, more long head stretch. So the assumption, and it is purely an assumption, and it is a false assumption, that if a muscle stretches more, it'll grow more. Well, if that were true, we would modify all of our exercises to include maximum stretch. But we know that's not actually true. A muscle only needs enough elongation, not maximum elongation. And maximum elongation, as we talked about earlier, is that first 10%. That's the dangerous part. So no, there is no advantage whatsoever to doing an overhead tricep extension versus 
a tricep extension with your arms are out in front of you or slightly alongside your body. What do you think of my arm position all the way back? Therefore, well, like two again, joints. Again, you know, having your arms overhead from a seated position, right? At least your upper arms are in the neutral position, which means it's not loading whatever um, muscle is trying to keep that upper arm bone in that position. By being on an incline like that, you've got an active upper arm lever, which means that the muscles that are, are keeping that from falling all the way back, and I don't mean by the elbow, I mean the whole arm, like coming out of the socket, yeah. is being strained, right? So there's a lot of unnecessary shoulder strain just to be in the position to do that exercise and then proceed with an exercise that has a reverse of good uh, resistance curve. It gives you more at the weakest part and less at the strongest part. It is a risky exercise, especially if uh, one uses a uh, heavy weight. Look, we, we encourage everyone to try it. Yeah. Go into the gym and try it. And we're here to provide information. So what I'm going to tell you is ask yourself, how does my shoulder feel in this position? Ask myself, do I feel like it's very easy at the beginning of the range of motion where it shouldn't? Ask myself, yes, I'm feeling it at the end of the range of motion, but at what cost? In other words, um, you're, what you're trading away to have a little resistance at the end of the range of motion is more resistance at the early part where you needed more. Okay. So you're going to get a compromised benefit from that. I hope uh, this uh, evaluation of the exercises will help you decide which exercises you should use in the gym so you avoid wasting your time and effort and injure yourself and start doing the right thing. If you want more detail about the exercises that we recommend, how you should set up the machines, how often you should do them, what intensity, sets and reps, then you can either buy the book from dougbrignoli.com or you can uh, go to Smart Training 365 and choose one of our programs. If you want to be certified, you can get the Physics of Fitness online program. Or you can uh, try True Bodybuilding. That will also cover the nutrition. It will cover the sets and reps. And if you're really thinking about competing, you will find how to uh, uh, everything about competition, even the posing from the golden era and how artistic posing as well. Make sure you subscribe if you're uh, watching us for the first time. And uh, I will see you next week. Thank you very much, Doug. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mo.